Hey everyone, welcome to the Squonk and the Hag podcast. As you may have realized by the lack of overt chaos in this introduction, this is Ranger, one of the researchers here on the podcast. I decided to commandeer the mic and do a small deep dive today, as Mo and Cracko are AFK and recharging. Before we get started, I will state that I am not an expert on anything, and that I am just pulling things together from what I know and can research. So, without further ado, let's get right to it. A while back, the podcast did an episode, of which I was a guest speaker, about the good folk and other beings from around the world. After that episode aired, we had a listener reach out and want more information on the Seely and Unseely Fae. So, that's what I will be talking about tonight. The Seely and Unseely are a classification of fairies. The term Seely originates in Scotland, and it derives from an older Norse or Germanic word, Selig, which means blissful or happy. Now, the modern English word Silly is also derived from this root. The word Unseely means unhappy, misfortunate, or unholy. These terms, folklorically, are used to differentiate between two courts of these beings. The Seely being the good court, and the Unseely being the bad one. It is interesting to note at this point that in recent times, like the 80s and 90s, these terms went through a bit of a metamorphosis in literature. Some writers decided to make the Unseely court the anti-heroes of the story, and the Seely court the bad guys. Like, shadowy, don't believe everything that looks nice is nice kind of bad guys. And I find that interesting, that as culture moved, so too did this move to make the good guys bad and the bad guys good. Moving on to some of the beings associated with the courts, there is in the Unseely court uh, these bright, almost elven kind of tinkerbells that are much more human than fae, in appearance at least. And in the Unseelie court, you have beings like the Redcaps, the Slough, and the Nuklavi. Now, I'm going to do a little small blurb on these beings, as they're just pretty freaking cool, uh, and I like sharing. Now, Redcaps, which they're also in tabletop RPGs, such as Pathfinder and uh, Dungeons & Dragons, are small humanoids with grizzled hair, sharp teeth, iron boots, skinny fingers with eagle's talons for nails, and a red cap. A red cap will kill travelers and dip his hat in their blood to dye it the characteristic hue it is named for. In, at least in Pathfinder, they are hobnailed iron boots. Completely unusable by anyone but a red cap, which is just wonderful flavor. I love it. The other being that we're going to talk about is called the Slough. And the Slough is a troop of spirits of the unforgiven dead or fairies. They fly in a crescent shape like birds, like Canada Goose, and have been known to sweep people up and take them away, just up and disappear. They can take the form of birds. Uh, Their appendages are long and gangly, ending in sharp nails. Their leathery wings give them the appearance of wearing a cape or cloak when not in use. They've also been known to go into a humanoid shape, where they look like old people uh, with very saggy skin, like it's not quite fitting right. Very, ugh, just not fun. Now, there is some conjecture on if these beings are human spirits of the dead or fairies. And I tend to think that the slough is both. As drawing from what I know of Irish folklore, The dead and the good neighbors of the fair folk, uh, those can be interchangeable at times. It depends on what you're kind of, what story you're reading or who you, really even who you ask. And then going on to our final being that I'm going to talk about, the Nuklavi is a demon, quote unquote, from the far northern reaches of Scotland. Quick shout out to Louis, one of our good friends here at the podcast, calls Scotland his home. It is said to be half human and half horse, the Nuklevi, not Louis. Its appearance is ghastly, as it has no skin and black blood courses through yellow veins, and the pale sinews and powerful muscles are visible as a pulsating mass. Ugh. It is associated with the ocean, funnily enough, and its legs are said to have fins. The Nuklevi's breath was thought to wilt crops and sicken livestock. 
and it was considered responsible for epidemics and drought. Another interesting thing about the Nuklevi is that it would it's literally half man, half horse. It would be as if there would be a horse body, and then in the middle where a human would presumably be riding it on a saddle is just this appendage of a person with a head, a torso, arms. Just, ugh, it's gross. This is definitely not something I want to meet during a fun outing at the beach. Ugh. Now, continuing to talk about the Sealy and Unsealy and how these terms originated. I believe I mentioned this in the previous episode, but in Irish folklore, people did not call the fairies by their name, which in this case would be the Tuatha Dé Danann. They were known as the Good Neighbors or the Fair Folk. The same is true in Scotland, as the term Seely seems to have been a euphemism for the fairies. This is basically a name that if the fairies were nearby and listening, invisible, they would not take offense to hearing that name. It's almost as if we, when using the name Seely, which means happy or blissful, that we are trying to bring out the goodness in the being that we are talking about, versus if we called them Unseely, or we would call them, you know, an imp or some other derogatory term, that that would then kind of make them be like, oh, well, maybe I do need to be bad around here. Maybe I do need to cause some mischief. So that's really what this is all kind of hinging on. Now, this is a well-documented thing, not only in Irish folklore, but also in Scottish literature, um, such as one poem from the 15th century, and I'll read an excerpt of it here. One, a woman of the Queen of Fairies, that takes goods to fairyland, through all broad Scotland has she been, on horseback on Halloween, and always in seeking certain knights, as she says, with our Seely Whites. Now, Seely in this case being good, or happy, or blissful, and Whites just meaning spirits, so literally good spirits, or fairies, or what have you. There is evidence that the Unseely, as a term, was not actually in use until the 18th century, and at that point is really only used for places, and the weather, and times. Never was it associated with the good people. That didn't take place until later in the 1900s. So we have about a three or four hundred year span where the term unseely isn't even used in regards to the fair folk. So now let's move on to the courts. In modern folklore, the seely and unseely courts are usually associated with summer and winter. The seely or summer court is full of light, benevolence, and goodness. In the unseely or winter court is the opposite of this. Darkness, malice, evil. The term court, in this case, brings to mind two political powers, somehow opposed to one another, kind of like two royal courts. However, this isn't always the case when looking at the Scots version of court. We need to realize that most of this has been translated from Scots Gaelic to English, and sometimes the meanings can get a little muddled. A lot of times, a court is used to mean a group or assembly of people, or in this case, fairies. We do see cases of the Scottish term court used in this way, where it's clear they're not talking about any kind of royal court. One such example is the Ballad of Tam Lin. The Ballad of Tam Lin has several variations, including some modern ones. But in the traditional ones dating to the 17th and 18th centuries, this concept of a court as a, pe- as a group of people is shown. In the ballad, when Tam Lin is telling Janet how to rescue him and explaining how the procession is going to pass by, he refers to different courts. The Court of the Knights, the Court of the Handmaidens, and then the Court of the King and Queen. In this case, it's pretty clear that it's the Scots' usage of the word meaning assembly or group and not a regal court. So, the Court of the Knights is a group of knights, and the Court of Handmaidens is a group of handmaidens that are passing by, and so on and so forth. It's only now, in the modern day and age, that we associate the courts as being a royal assembly or something along those lines. 
A ranger, I hear you asking. You just read an excerpt from a 15th century poem that says that there's a fairy queen. And you would be correct, dear listener. This is where things can get a little murky. Now, we don't know how the Seelie structure their government, for one. For two, if it's anything like in Ireland, there are fairy mounds, and each one has a king or queen associated with it, and is a kingdom in itself, so to speak. So, saying queen or king might just be a way to tell who is the leader of this troop of fairies. Might not be a queen or a king at all. The fair folk are fluid. So, for example, a brownie, a fae being known for helping around the house if you respect it and give it offerings, can become a boggart, a nasty little being that breaks things, spoils food, and the like, but only if you don't respect the brownie. Now, a brownie would be considered a seelie in the modern context, but it can change based on how it is perceived and how it interacts with humans and how humans interact with it. So, saying that all seelie fae have one queen, or even a queen at all, and the seelie having another, is purely a modern concept. Now, the Fae will not be contained by the boxes we humans try to put them in. We really only see these terms begun to be used fully in the 1980s by fantasy authors. It's honestly these kind of of things I find fascinating about the good neighbors. They are very much like the world we live in. They are beautiful and terrifying, benevolent and baleful. To put them into categories as small as courts, just to make them manageable, makes them small to me. And I feel like that's doing them a disservice. All right, that's all the time I have for today. I really enjoyed doing this. I hope that you guys did as well. If you guys did like it, please let us know uh, and give me a suggestion on what you want me to talk about next. There's been some talk between myself and one of the other researchers, Allie, uh, about maybe doing a little bit of a researcher fireside if that's something people are interested in doing. If you or anyone you know has any first or second hand accounts about seeing a ghost or having a close encounter with some type of true crime, please send them to us, those stories, in an email or in a comment on one of our social media platforms. We'd love to read those. And we're thinking of eventually collecting enough of them to do a listener special at some point. Anyway, I hope that this little blurb of a deep dive has found you well. And may you be blessed. Good night, everyone. And don't worry about that thing behind you right now. He's usually friendly.